Good morning and welcome to the 10th meeting in 2017 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Can I remind everyone to um, switch your electronic devices to silent, although I think we might indulge Mr McGregor in a glance at his phone occasionally over the course of the proceedings. Our first item for the committee is to take evidence on two proposed cross-party groups. The first group will have to consider today the proposed CPG on future of football in Scotland. And I would like to welcome Fulton McGregor, MSP, to the meeting, who is the proposed convener of the group. And I would invite Fulton McGregor to make an opening statement about the purpose of the group. Uh, thank you, convener. Thanks uh, for, the, um, for the welcome and giving me the opportunity to come to committee um, today. Uh, it is very different being at this side of the table, uh, I have to say. And thanks also for... Um, just to explain to members who, who might not know what uh, this yesterday was our due date, so uh, hence why I've been given permission to check the phone. Um, I don't uh, plan to speak for long. Um, I, I think that the the merits of this group largely uh, speak for themselves. Football is uh, Scotland's national game, yet for years our national team uh, has underperformed um, at the national stage. And I think we can look at countries like Iceland that have got substantially lower populations where football isn't as much as part of the fabric eh, of their country and who are performing way beyond eh, the world stage in Iceland is, of course, only one example. And I'm not suggesting for a minute that the cross-party group eh, take over the running of the SFA, not, of course, in any way, um, but I think it can provide a platform for all organisations and stakeholders eh, to come together with fans and associations to discuss and promote the game. And, and I think across all other areas of civic life in Scotland, um, you know, it's everyone's job to do the best we can. We're, we're all on other committees and it's, you know, we talk about government councils, voluntary and private sector organisations working in partnership in harmony to get the best outcome for Scotland's institutions. And I do believe that in my discussions with the SFA about uh, setting up this group, that they have been open uh, to that as well. And I think that, you know, uh, football in that uh, respect shouldn't be any different. Um, there is also a problem with access uh, to the game in this country, and I've had conversations with the Scottish Disabled Supporters Association, who I'm delighted to say will be part of the group uh, if it is approved, and um, they have revealed some troubling information about the struggle faced by many as they attend their chosen club's games. Um, also, in terms of young people's access to the game, I used Iceland earlier as an example um, to hold up high. They've made it very easy for young people uh, to to get involved um, and get the support that they need to develop as a player. Uh, and I think in many areas of Scotland, and it's been talked about in the Chamber a lot, we've moved to this sort of 3G, 4G pitches, um, which are far too pricey for uh, for our young people. You're know, talking about hundreds of pounds to book out these pitches, and I know that I know that many members, even around the table here, uh, have discussed that in in the chamber. Um, it, it does make sense, obviously, to have the old uh, weather pitches, um, but you know the charges, as I've said, are, are far too much. And, and gone are the days. It seems that you know that I can remember, and probably other members too, where you know we just went out and played football on the street, uh, or a wee bit of grass, any bit of grass would do, uh, you know. But well, there's. Well, there's obviously uh, health and safety issues around that, and I'm, I'm not suggesting a, a full return to that. I think we do need to capture some of the uh, the, the random play aspects that were were available before, um, and whether that's you know working with local authorities and other organisations to reduce the uh, the costs. Um, everybody will have read the aims of the group. Um, you know what it is. We hope to write a platform for discussion with a view to improving all aspects of our national game. And, and finally, convener, if I may, I would just like to touch on the, the MSP membership of the group uh, as it stands. I am uh, disappointed that no female MSP has joined the group. Um, you know, the requests went out every day and that, the, the members who were there were the ones uh, who responded. However, I do believe that the wider membership of the group uh, will ensure that issues faced by women and girls in football in Scotland are kept in sharp focus. The secretary of the group uh, is herself a former Scotland Women's International, or the sec I should say the secretary of the proposed group, uh, and very well highly regarded in the game. And the SWFA uh, have agreed to play a full part in the group as well and have been very supportive. So I will continue to encourage all members uh, to participate in the group and become involved. Um, but I just wanted to put uh, on record that um, 
I was aware of the all-male makeup of the group, um, and it's something that we will seek to challenge within the, the group uh, if it's set up. Thanks. I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr McGregor. Can I uh, have any questions, Mr Arthur? Uh, good morning, Mr McGregor. Um, I think this is a very timely, actually, in the future of football. If we reflect, um, it's 50 years now since perhaps that high watermark for Scottish football in 1967. Um, but what I'd like just to focus on is particular aspects um, of the grassroots. I'm a member of the Health and Sport and Committee, and access to sport is something we've been looking at more generally. I just wonder sp specifically, um, have you made any approaches to some of uh, the football teams at the, the, the lower levels who are engaging in social enterprises? And it's, their activity goes beyond um, simply facilitating um, youngsters to play football, but to actually play a much more positive and constructive role within their communities. I wonder if football as a social enterprise and as a social good is an area that you'll be considering um, throughout the group. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, um, that that question. I think that um, that is an area where we would look to develop. And uh, obviously the group hasn't been set up yet, so we haven't had an initial uh, meeting other than the one to, uh, to discuss the, the aims and objectives. But that is an area where... I am very passionate about it as well, and I think that I would, uh, as if, if the group goes ahead, and uh, you know, I'm convener. It's something that I would like to see uh, more around because, um, for example, my own club uh, in Coatbridge, Albion Rovers, have got a, a you know a, a rich history in that recently. You know, during the summer and uh, other school holidays, they provide a a, a training. Uh, camp for youngsters and it, actually the club is right over from my offices so we get to see it because a lot of this time is during recess and there's you know hundreds of kids involved they're dropped off uh, you know early uh, in the morning and they're picked up about three o'clock and that is them um, you know all day getting that sort of uh, interaction so it's definitely uh, an area I'd like to look more at. Hey, Mr Stuart. Thank you, Thank you Mr McGregor. Delighted to see you're looking at access, affordability, and uh, the cost impaired, because that can be a real barrier uh, to a number of individuals who want to get involved and participate. Uh, and the whole idea of you know, getting community engagement, uh, which Mr. Arthur's touched on with being the whole social aspect and, and community-based, I think is very important. So uh, in all of those, uh, what, what, what would be your main drive uh, at trying to achieve uh, early days with the group if the group is set up? Yeah, I, th I think uh, it is about access and, and widening that access out. Um, two of the areas that I mentioned, I've already had some provisional discussions with the, uh, the supporters disability forum, and they've been they've been very forthcoming and very welcoming of the group. And I'd like to do a bit more work uh, around that area. The the group have de described that some stadiums in Scotland are are more accessible, uh, and some clubs are more accessible than others. And there'll be perhaps a, an opportunity to to um, look into that a bit more uh, and try and encourage all clubs to be at a similar level. I think um, I think Dunfermline is possibly one of the better examples, um, you know, when I spoke to the, the forum. So um, that's maybe an idea that we can maybe invite Dunfermline to come to see what they've done to be, um, to, to be that and uh, see if there's any lessons learned elsewhere. And obviously also I mentioned the... Um, you know, the women's football as well, and the, the role that um, the organisations representing women's football will have in uh, the group, and I'm hoping that that will help to, uh, help to extend extend things out. And obviously we've got the, the championships coming up as well, and we'll be all very proud of our team going forward. Hopefully they'll do well. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Any further questions? Um, could I ask, uh, Mr McGregor, um, I have in my constituency one of the SFE uh, Centres of Excellence for Football in Braytarsh High School. Indeed, um, they've just won that under 18 Scottish Shield, which I attended at Hamden and was delighted to do so in support of them. Um, I wondered if um, any local, given that schools are an important role, and I remember when I was a youngster, a long, long time ago, the school estate was open and not closed. So, so in the, the summer months, we had access to the football pitches and that all changed for um, very um, uh, reasonable reasons. Um, and they're now fenced off and that access isn't there for people. So have you engaged with local authorities, invited local authorities, since they could play a very important part, both in terms of the curriculum in the schools, but also the access to the school estates? Yeah, I think it's, it's an area that we would definitely propose the group to look at. Um, and because I think, as I mentioned in the opening statement, 
um, that, uh, you know, with all good situations in our constituency, I've got, um, you know, the, the brand new 4G pitches at um, St Ambrose uh, in Coatbridge, and, and you drive by that during the summer and you've got this massive area of land just unused. Um, don't get me wrong, on a Saturday morning or whatever, you know, there's maybe various teams on it probably charged quite a lot to be there. Um, but you go drive by at other points in the summer and there's nobody on it. And that area used to actually be, um, for anybody that knows the area, the SB side pitches. And we all just used to play on it, you know, and it go down. So the, we definitely need to do some work with local authorities in terms of, um, in terms of um, you know, making these areas more accessible uh, for young people. But... Uh, and that's something that I would like the, the group definitely to look at. And it's something that I think members will know that I've raised in the chamber uh, when we've had discussions around play and, and various other uh, aspects as well. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Harvey. Uh, thanks very much. Good morning. Um, it's obviously for the group to decide its own uh, work programme and uh, you probably shouldn't take advice from someone who knows as little about football as I do. But uh, in the last session, the Scottish Government uh, did take forward some... Uh, perhaps tentative uh, proposals on fan ownership uh, and I wonder whether that's something that you've discussed either looking at the, the current status of fan ownership uh, in Scotland or uh, following up on the, the moves that the Scottish Government took in the last session uh, following some, some cross-party pressure uh, to see what the, the further opportunities might be to expand fan ownership and look at the, the, the governance of, uh, of uh, kind of private ownership within the within the sport and, and whether that's working well in the interests of fans or communities? It's not been discussed yet, but again, I think it's something that can be a, an agenda a item, certainly on the um, the, the, the cross-party group. And it, it kind of links into to Mr Arthur's point as well, you know, just about the it, what, what clubs are doing to manage their own situations of social enterprises, fan ownership. I think all this stuff is interlinked. I think... For me, probably, it is, a, it is one of the ways we need to consider going forward, particularly for the smaller clubs, um, you know, and how, how they now survive in the, uh, in the, the kind of modern, uh, modern climate. And I think it's probably worth noting that um, when we talk about football being Scotland's national game, that a wee fact that a lot of people aren't fully aware of is that per head, uh, there's more people go to games in Scotland than any other country in Europe. Um, but that still doesn't help the smaller clubs who are struggling with attendance. So um, I think that's something we definitely want to look at. But you also raised a good point in your opening remarks, eh, Mr Harvey, that when you said that um, you, you didn't eh, know a lot about football, I apologise for my phone, you didn't know it. That, that's actually the purpose of the group. Uh, it's, it's to be inclusive for everybody, uh, whether they have an interest in football directly or not, because it being such a big part of Scottish civic life, it does impact on all of our constituencies. So... Um, thanks for asking that, George. Okay, uh, Ms Harper. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, Good morning, Fulton. Um, I am curious about in item number four, it talks about the attempt to make the game affordable, accessible and safe. So that would be for people um, participating. But I'm interested in uh, looking at af affordability for people to go and watch games whether it's big games or big season games or, you know, I'm aware that ticket prices can be quite high. So is that something that you'd be considering maybe in the group? Yeah, I think um, it is something that, you know, the, the cross-party group um, can only can only make, you know, suggestions to give a forum to have a, have a discussion on it and, and hopefully, um, you know, gently influence uh, behaviour of clubs. But obviously the prices of tickets uh, for matches is... is down to clubs, but what I would like to do through the group is look at where examples uh, have been positive. For example, uh, to use Albion Rovers again, a couple of seasons ago, they had a buy your season ticket for whatever you want. Uh, and it ended up people would maybe give a wee bit of money, but, but if people couldn't afford it, they could buy it for a penny or a pound, I think it was. I think Motherwell have done a, a similar thing in Vina. Um, so what, what might be the best way to do that is to, to bring clubs who uh, have had successful initiatives around uh, reducing ticket prices in uh, and seeing if that can be replicated elsewhere. Okay. Mr Scott. Thanks very much. And um, I think this is a very good idea as well. You will, of course, be aware, given your involvement in um, future football in Scotland, that there's a, a level of unhappiness with some of the um, legislation surrounding um, crowd behaviour at football matches at the moment. Will that be one of the things that you will be considering when you're cross-party group? 
We don't propose to have um, uh, discussions on the anti-social behaviour at football uh, laws because there's already parliamentary processes around that. So there's been a bill passed and, and obviously I think that uh, James Kelly's bringing forward a member's bill. So there's parliamentary processes already in place for that. However, if the membership of the group and people are coming to us, uh, say that at a future point that that's became more of an issue than, than given the, the scope of the group, we would uh, reconsider that. But the initial discussions in setting this up is more around about uh, accessibility and, and kind of the other forms. Um, although it, it has to be acknowledged that if there's difficult behaviour at football matches, then that can obviously affect accessibility because you know people would maybe then choose not to take young children to games where they suspect that type of behaviour might be happening. So at this point in time, no, it's not. But it, the group, can, I, I think you'd expect if the group uh, evolves and, and wants to take in, into account that, then we'd do that. But I'm aware of the parliamentary processes in place at the moment around, around those issues. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't really have any question for you. All I would say is that I think anything that seeks to promote uh, people being active is good and anything that seeks to ensure that Scotland returns to the top flight of international football is good so I wish you very well <laughs> much um, thank you um, on that note um, I think the questions are finished I thank Mr McGregor for attending this morning uh, our decision will be taken later in the agenda this morning and you'll be informed of our decision as quickly as possible thank you very much I'll suspend shortly to allow witnesses to change over Thank you. The second group we have to consider today is the proposed CPG on rare genetic and undiagnosed conditions. I would like to welcome Bob Boris, MSP, to the meeting and Bob is a proposed convener of the group. And I would invite Mr Doris to make an opening statement. Yeah, thank you, convener. Uh, perhaps at the start of an opening statement, I'd like to put on record uh, thanks to, to two individuals as we seek to re-register this, this group all under a new and new terms of reference, I, I would readily acknowledge. The first one would be Alistair Kent of Genetic Alliance UK, who is stepping down from that role, who over the years, not just in Scotland, but across the UK, has done a huge effort to, to draw to people's attentions the, 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 the plight of those living with uh, rare undiagnosed and genetic conditions. And I think it's only fair to do that. And the other would be uh, the former MSP, Malcolm Chisholm, uh, who was co-convener of last session's cross party group along with myself who did a, a massive job in, in really leading in relation to, to the cross party group. Whilst I was co-convener, I think it's fair to say that uh, Mr Chisholm was a real force of nature and I hope to, to, to follow in those footsteps, at least partially, uh, should this group be be, be re-registered. At the outset, I'd also like to talk about one of my first experiences uh, in, in relation to the issues around the cross-party group. In the last session, I was deputy chair of the, the Health and Sport Committee, and we received a number of petitions, one in relation to rare diseases that come through the Petitions Committee of this Parliament, and it eventually led to an inquiry into access to medicines within the Scottish Parliament, and uh, most importantly, did it in a, a non-partisan, non-political way at the last session's Health and Sport Committee, and the Scottish Government responded in a similar fashion, and we drove real change. One of the, the reasons that was possible was because of the, the cross-party group and the networking effect that those living with their conditions, their families and the campaign groups getting together can, can have in relation to that and driving a real momentum in that area. So I want to put those things on the record, but I also want to put some brief facts on the record as well, convener, if, if time will allow... Um, uh, at this point. So the cross-party group on rare diseases existed in the last parliament and undertook important work relating to issues affecting the rare disease community. Topics covered included, and I have already mentioned, access to new medicines for very rare conditions, improving research opportunities for rare diseases, gaps in specialist nursing provision, and improving coordination of specialist care services. The group played an important role in monitoring the implementation of the plan for rare disease in Scotland, facilitating an opportunity for stakeholder involvement in the development of work undertaken by the Scottish Government 
in this area. The cross-party group for rare genetic and undiagnosed conditions will build on this work but expand the remit to include genetic and undiagnosed conditions. That's the difference in the terms of reference I was referring to, convener. In Scotland, there are over 2,000 babies born with a genetic condition every single year. This equates to one in every 25 babies born. In addition, there are over 6,000 recognised rare conditions estimated to affect over 300,000 people uh, within Scotland. Whilst there are many different rare and genetic conditions, there are many similar issues facing patients and their families. Regardless of their specific conditions, many people affected by genetic and rare conditions report similar challenges, including difficulties in obtaining timely diagnosis, difficulties in accessing appropriate specialist care, support, difficulties in accessing appropriate information, difficulties in accessing treatment and lack of coordination of care. Whilst there are a number of conditions specific cross-party groups, there are no cross-party groups that adequately address the challenges facing patients affected by rare genetic and undiagnosed conditions. And it's in that context that I'm seeking permission from this committee to re-register with a different terms of reference this particular cross-party group convener. Thank you very much. Can I invite any questions, Mr. Arthur? Thank you, convener, and good morning, Mr. Doris. Um, one of the uh, stated purposes is to act as a, a channel of communication between the Scottish Parliament and families affected. Um, I'm just wondering, um, in the membership, um, and perhaps you can, I'm um, aware of the, of, the, of the work of the committee in its previous incarnation in the last session, how the, the, the group, you envisage the group functioning in terms of its relationship with um, affected families and individuals, would that be through these individuals and families being members of the group? Would it be uh, through other means? I wonder if you could perhaps um, elaborate on that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, perhaps I could I could give a very specific example. I, I hasten to add before the, the group's been re-registered, I sponsored a, a Rare Disease Day in, in the Scottish Parliament, hoping to become convener of, of this particular cross-party group. And a rather inspirational lady um, uh, spoke about her experience with EDS syndrome. I, I'll, I'll stick to the acronym rather than mispronounce the, the, the syndrome itself. But... Um, it was a powerful speech about how there was uh, deficiencies in managed clinical networks, issues with diagnosis and a variety of other issues. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Health had been at the start of the meeting but had actually missed that particular speech and had to leave for other diary commitments. So uh, the person making the speech worked with myself and through the yet-to-be-registered members of the cross-party group to contact the Scottish Government and there's now been meetings and engagement to improve that situation. So there's a very specific example where maybe uh, we're not seeking to be another health committee of the Scottish Parliament, that's most clearly what we're not seeking to be, but there are time constraints in all MSPs and there's time constraints in all, all standing committees of this Parliament and there was one example we could pick up an issue of uh, a genetic condition and move on it very, very quickly. Individuals are entitled to, to join this cross-party group in their own right or they can join through one of the, the, the various uh, organisations listed. You'll see on the, the provisional forum it does indeed list organisations, but there's nothing to preclude any individual from seeking to be a member in their own right. The philosophy behind the membership of this cross-party group would be an inclusive one, and it would be to be openly engaged and work in partnership where we can with committees of the Parliament and with uh, the Scottish Government. Thank you. And another a, a further question. Um, you, in your opening statement, um, referenced the work that the, the group had previously um, done um, in regards to access to medicines, and you state that access to new medicines for orphan and ultra um, orphan conditions is going to be a key aspect of your work. I just wonder if you know the challenges we face. We're going to be approaching one year since the Montgomery review with the SDMC, etc. How you seek to advance that agenda um, over the course of this session within the group? Well, I think the first thing I would say, the, the core way to advance that agenda is the Health and Sport Committee working in partnership with the Scottish Government, as I'm sure they will in this session, as they did in the in the last session. I would also put on record that these are really worthwhile challenges we face because um, people with various conditions in this country have never had such significant access to, to, to new medicines, including those with rare conditions and, and with uh, genetic conditions. The issue is technology and scientific advancements just move on so quickly and expectations increase so so speedily as well and quite rightly so. So there's a challenge for government and challenge for the Health and Sport Committee of this Parliament in relation to with the Montgomery Review and you know and other stakeholders as well seeking to make sure that the it's, it's like a continuous review we need of access to medicines in this country. I think history shows that um, if we're not careful, those with uh, 
conditions where there's only three, four, five families in Scotland can be squeezed out of, of that debate. In fact, the debate in relation to uh, rare diseases was, was, was pretty silent in, until, uh, not the cross-party group, but in, until uh, Rare Disease UK marshalled the various families together, quite inspirational families, in realising that actually together there's nothing rare about having a, a rare condition. And that was the purpose of... Um, that particular organisation, and that's certainly the purpose of the cross-party group. It's not to lead the political debate on it, but it's to provide that link, communication link and networking of various families and groups seeking to support those who are living with uh, rare and genetic conditions and need undiagnosed conditions. So anything we can do to making sure when that review is progressed further, that they, I'm sure they won't be squeezed out. I know the Scottish government's on the ball with this, but you know we, we don't take anything for granted, and I want to make sure the cross party has a role to play in relation to that. I, I agree absolutely. Um, I think it's very important. I think a lot of the decisions um, and the processes for decision taking in terms of access to medicine can be quite highly complicated and, and very challenging. Um, and often it's it struck me certainly that engaging with my own constituents there can be a a disconnect um, and a lack of understanding of what the various motivations are between. Of why certain decisions are taking. So I think there's clearly an opportunity uh, to provide a, a platform for the information and communication and for participation. Um, and I think that's something to be commended. Um, we've got Mr Harvey. Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, just wanted to ask about the group's external membership. Um, uh, very happy to see this group being recreated. Uh, obviously, though, uh, you know, issues around uh, drug treatment uh, are one in which there's a, sometimes a tension between uh, evidence-based decisions and lobbying efforts uh, by companies involved. Can I ask whether any of your external members are private sector organisations, uh, drug companies or, or others, uh, or are funded by them, and whether you've discussed as a group what your approach would be uh, if uh, private sector organisations such as drug companies wanted to become external members? I think that's a a really, really important question. Don't know if I've got all the answers to that. But I can perhaps give a an initial comment and uh, and point out that um, I think if we look back at the last session of the Health and Sport Committee, uh, my relationship with uh, with pharmaceutical companies was one of con constructive scrutiny, uh, where I thought they overcharged and overpromised for what their medicines could could deliver, and that the people of Scotland were not getting the best deal or best served by the pharmaceutical companies. Um, they do indeed, under very strict rules of engagement, uh, to a various degrees, fund various patient groups. I do not know uh, in relation to each of the patient groups and organisations listed here, but I think it would be good practice. I don't think, it, 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 I don't think it's required, but I think it would be good practice to, for transparency to have a statement in relation to that. So what I would intend doing is uh, checking with these organisations and making that, uh, a, a, I'm sure it is a public record, but I think it should be a centralised public record, Mr Harvey, rather than each individual MSP or individual member of society having to look, look at the organisations and then cross-reference that with other public record information. So let's get it centralised, let's get it in the one place, and I'm happy to, to, to provide that. I'm not sure if we need a... A policy, a protocol, and how we deal with pharmaceutical companies. We're not here for pharmaceutical companies. We would be there for the patients and the families uh, of rare genetic undiagnosed conditions. But I'd be happy to put that on the agenda at our first appropriately constituted meeting. But uh, it also gave me the opportunity, Mr. Harvey, to say again that I think drug companies have to do a lot more in relation to affordability, uh, and maybe they should be paid more based on the outcomes of not clinical trials, but out the real life outcomes of uh, medicines once taken by, by patients in wider society. So not cash up front, but cash on delivery for the outcomes that they claim from their clinical trials. And I'm happy to put that on the record again today. That's very helpful. I mean, the, the, the committee's discussed the, the issue of, of mm. private sector organisations being external CPG members against which there is no rule, and it, it does happen. Uh, but I think uh, perhaps we've We've acknowledged that there's some thought needed uh, in that area, but I'm, I'm very uh, happy to hear the, the response from Bob Doris, and I think it's a very constructive approach. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Scott. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. And can I just first of all begin by declaring an interest um, as a member of this proposed cross-party group, and also um, someone who uh, has a rare genetic um, 
am conditioned myself. Um, so I've got an interest in two fronts in that regard, um, and therefore I'm interested in the element of genetic and genome, genomic research. And do you see a way of, of, of encouraging that type of research? And also, do you see a way, Mr. Doris, of um, essentially um, collaborative working with other cross-party groups who have an interest in this area as well, maybe joint working with them? Or not? Well, um, I, I think dealing with the last point of your question first, I think in joint working. I think the proliferation of cross party groups in this parliament necessitates joint working, quite frankly. Um, I think that's something that your committee has been grappling with over a number of years of du duplication and overlap in relation to cross party groups. I don't think this is one, but I think. It, it would be incumbent upon this cross party group to, if you like, mainstream its work, so where we can we can identify something that would be of interest to another cross party group. Let's have that joint working and uh, and, and 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 do that. Just remind me of the first part of your, your question, Mr. Just Scott. a way of encouraging genomic research. Ah, I was trying to dodge that bullet. Uh, yes, as far as Malcolm Chisholm uh, was sitting beside me, who would have done a lot more in relation to that. But I got a very inspirational. Um, presentation from NHS clinicians in relation to the Human Genome Project uh, at the Rare Disease uh, Day at the Scottish Parliament. Amazing work, uh, both publicly and privately funded in both Glasgow and Edinburgh in relation to that. Don't always get the science of it, but I'm a politician, I don't have to get the science of it, I just have to get the huge opportunities there is to transform the lives of of, of people in Scotland, the length and breadth of the country. So I think I have to get my knowledge base up around that. I know there's a potential proposed visit uh, to one of the sites um, that I'm hoping to go along and find out more. But yeah, I think anything the, the cross party group can do to help promote that and awareness raise around it as well uh, is really important. It might also worth putting on the record as well that when various uh, health related issues, whether it's the Human Genome Project or whether it's uh, clinical trials or whatever, Scotland is probably the, the best country in the world for collecting data. Some would say we collect too much data, particularly in, in relation to health. Um, and if you actually look at the, um, the if you like, the, the DNA footprint of Scotland and the data we collect, we are best placed, we're world leading by default in terms of the opportunities in doing some of this stuff. And I think the Human Genome Project is another example uh, in relation to that. And my last answer to Mr Harvey was slightly critical of pharmaceutical companies, but it's also worth putting on record that if pharmaceutical companies are looking for the best place to do real-life clinical trials, given the data we collect in this country, Scotland is world leading. Thank you. Uh, and I thank you for that answer, which is very comprehensive. And I just also uh, would like to put on my record my appreciation of Malcolm Chisholm's work as a previous co-convener and indeed as a much missed member of this parliament. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Scott. Um, Mr. Stewart, you had a question? Uh, Mr. Ross, I very much welcome the fact that it's going to be uh, reformed and you've come here today to, to, to sell that point, and I think you've done that extremely well. Uh, the areas you're going to examine are health and social care provision. Now, th that is quite complicated in, in how you progress that, and dealing with some of the, the scientists and the clinicians that will be part of that process. Uh, uh, you've touched on how we're world leading in the world sector. Uh, how are you going to manage to progress that? And how are you planning to do anything along any other lines? Are you going to talk to some other groups that are in other parliaments uh, across uh, the United Kingdom? Or uh, are you going to look at things that are happening elsewhere, uh, outside uh, in Europe? Because m much of this uh, has a real broad base uh, uh, and it gives, it gives many people the opportunity to examine what's happening uh, within the, the health uh, and social care provision. I think uh, yes to all of that, but as I as I as I elaborate slightly, a slight health warning in relation to that. I, I will be the convener of the new cross party group. Um, whilst it has to be parliamentary in nature, the point of it is kind of to engage and listen, and allow the stakeholders to shape some of that agenda. So I wouldn't want to sit here running saying one of the things we're going to look at is how health and social care services meet the needs of those living with a. Uh, rare genetic and undiagnosed conditions and that's going to be our priority because the, the, there's, there's various matters in there including for example monitor and contribute to the implementation of the Scottish plan for rare diseases in Scotland if, if the stakeholders decide they want to scrutinise that more rather than the service provided with the new integrated joint boards across Scotland for example then I'd be partially led by 
by, by, by the groups, the patients' groups involved. So I think that sounds like a really good idea. Uh, I think it's one maybe the member might want to make at the next meeting of the cross-party group of rare genetic undiagnosed conditions. would certainly welcome you on, on board and, and, and would love your experience in relation to that. But we're open-minded to exploring that further, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran. And um, Ms Harper. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning. Um, Last week I participated in a debate on uh, myalgic encephalitis and yesterday there was a debate led by Ash Denham on neurofibromatosis. So obviously there's a lot of awareness raising is conducted in Parliament in members' debates, which is a great way to do that. And I welcome uh, the cross-party group to be reformed so that we can continue to raise awareness and bring everybody together because there is obviously inequality in the provision of care. Last night I met a nurse who is a genetic nurse based in Greater Glasgow, but she covers the southwest of Scotland, Eyre and Dumfries and Galloway, so it's really rural and it's really challenging. But one of the things that I'm interested in is uh, mm. um, GPs, British Medical Association, would they be linked with this? Because raising awareness is, uh, among GPs is often a good way to start because they are the first stop that people have. But obviously we have challenges with GP numbers already in Scotland and uh, what would be your thoughts on engaging the medical practitioners? Well, I, I, I would assume that when we wanted to to look at that particular area, we'd get certain key professionals in, whether we want to get them from the Royal College of General Practitioners in, for example, or as I said at the, in my opening statement, with EDS syndrome, one of the the issues with that was the, the, the length of time it takes for diagnosis and the awareness of GPs and there are managed clinical networks and guidelines in relation to these matters. Sometimes you can take it from the grassroots, making sure GPs on the ground are familiar with it and get the information out there, but sometimes it has to make sure that the, the, the clinical pathways um, and the clinical managed clinical networks are fit for purpose as well. So I think I think that's a, a, a very good idea. I'm just conscious that we do throw a lot at GPs, they are generalists by nature. So sometimes it's making sure that when they see a potential uh, issue, that they have the appropriate, they have the confidence to move through the appropriate referral pathway. And I agree absolutely because it's not always a GP that is the specialist or recognising diagnostic um, treatment pathways, but advanced nurse practitioners might be included as part of the managed clinical network for, I guess assessing, diagnosing and helping people get on the right treatment pathways? I, I, would, I would absolutely uh, support that. Not only will, will, will patients get a, a quicker, speedier service, they'll actually get a, a, a far superior service because a, a, a nurse specialist doing, becomes a real expert doing something every single week. Vari various medical clinicians, uh, doctors maybe do things once in a while. So actually the nurse specialists get, get really quite slick and and on top of the game in relation to doing that. So it's a better service very often, but it's also much cheaper for, for the NHS. So it's certainly something we have to expand more. And I think that's the direction of travel. Again, I think the challenge in this area has been, uh, it's the challenge with preventative spend more, more generally, isn't it? And in, in service redesign, you have to invest to save later down the line. So there's been a significant expansion of nurse specialists, but who are we to sit here as MSPs and say to other groups that as yet don't have nurse specialists at all, whilst others are, are campaigning for an expansion of their nurse specialist service and their ends the, the rub. I think within that context, um, rare genetic undiagnosed conditions, again, could be squeezed out if we're not careful. So that's why I think you raise a really interesting point, as Mr Stewart did as well, in relation to as these as these care pathways are being and treatment pathways are being designed, just making sure it's also there for those living with their conditions as well. Okay. Um uh, I think that's the end of the the question, so that I should declare an interest as well as someone who's likely to be a member uh, of the cross party group if established. And I thank uh, Mr. Doris for his attendance. Um, the decision will be taken at agenda item two. And um, thank you very much for coming to committee to this morning. I'll suspend shortly to let the witness leave. Okay, we uh, now come to agenda. Agenda item two, which is a consideration of the two proposed party groups from this morning. Um, can I invite any comments about the future of football in Scotland? No. Uh, are we content to agree that CPG? 
that you know thank you very much uh, and the second cpg was rare genetic and undiagnosed conditions any comments from members we can dent to agree that cross-party group thank you very much we now move to agenda item three which is a consideration of a draft annual report and i would invite any general comments from members this morning Could I maybe start with with, with one? Um, uh, I um, want to thank the clerks for the work uh, on producing the draft report, which I think is very comprehensive, like covers a lot of what we have done. Um, I wondered if it would be possible to have a paragraph just to note our engagement with the work of the presiding officer and his review of parliamentary procedures, just to say that we have had a couple of witness sessions um, covering that area. Members be content to... Include that. So <laughs> paying sufficient attention for the I was just saying the, the report doesn't um recognise the work we've done in engaging um regarding the presiding officer's uh, um review of parliamentary procedures. I just wondered if that paragraph could be added in. I, I would agree with that. Really, I was going to raise that point. Okay. okay. Thank you. I we content for the clerks to draft something that can be approved by email with the group. Yep. Is that good? And is the rest of the report um approved? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we now move into private session.